day of the retreats tomorrow is gonna be the one day session so you got the best slice ahead of you and then after that there's gonna be a small campfire um, I want to give a little talk first are there any questions up front anything you would like to ask Um, there was a small talk I had with the retreat participants at uh, nine o'clock under the tree outside. One of the questions that was asked, what, uh, what purpose Zen practice has? So that's uh, one thing I would like to talk about first. And if there's other questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, so what purpose does this practice have? Mm, and you all probably already know the official answer, no purpose. Mm. Doesn't have a purpose. Uh, but then again, I mean, why would people come all the way to practice at Antaiji? Uh, like, well, originally we had 13 uh, people who uh, wanted to come to the retreat because of the historic rainfalls. It's only seven, five uh, had the luck that they could come here on the first day. Uh, two had to spend three days in Osaka and Himeji to come here for the last two days. There was one uh, person who came all the way to Japan uh, participate in the first three days of the retreat he could only take those uh, first three days and unfortunately he had to exit Japan again two days so he in the end he couldn't come here to stay uh, three days in the capsule hotel in Osaka mm -hmm. and leave uh, Japan again without even having come here so people make some effort to, to actually go all the way to Antaiji. Uh, you, you use your time, you spend your money uh, to practice here only for a short amount of time. So it would be, of course, good to know for what purpose. Um, well, one way to answer or to reply to that question would be, well, why do you ask me? Why do you ask me? Uh, you are the one. You are all the ones that kind of made the way to Antaiji. Uh, you had to buy a plane ticket if you came from abroad. Uh, you're putting in your time here. Um, the people who participate in the retreat, they pay for the retreat. So you should know why you do it. Why do you ask me? I'm basically I'm doing it because it's my job. I'm only doing it. I'm in here for the money, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me why you 
do it. I mean, well, of course you can ask me and, and to be honest, it doesn't pay so well, even for myself. So I'm, I'm starting to ask myself why I'm actually doing this still after almost 30 years here in Antarctica. Um, so first of all, I want to try to um, give an answer. Uh, what's the purpose of this practice? What's the difference, for example, between three days at the capsule hotel and three days at Antaiji? Uh, couldn't it, wouldn't it be possible to practice Zen at a capsule hotel or anywhere in the world? And the answer, of course, is in theory, yes, but then probably it makes a difference. Uh, if people could practice Zen anywhere in the world, in any location, there wouldn't be a point in coming to Antaji. Mm, so what is that difference? Mm, of course, it would be best if you try to find out by yourself. Those who spend time here already had opportunity to do that. Tomorrow you will have another day uh, opportunity to see what difference it makes to sit for 10 hours on the cushion and to spend 10 hours like Sebastian will do in a couple of days sitting on the beach with a beer. <laughs> um, <laughs> or you're kind of in an internet cafe surfing the internet for 10 hours. Um, you will see the difference that it makes by yourself. Mm, uh, for example, during the winter in Antarctica, we have a lot of time to do whatever we want. You can study, you can practice a Zen in your room if you want to, you can surf the internet if you want to. And uh, it, there's an obvious difference between 10 hours of doing this and 10 hours of doing that. Um, Tomorrow, when you sit there in front of the wall, uh, 10 hours, you probably will ask yourself at one point, why am I doing this? Mm. And if you would be sitting in front of your computer or you would be sitting there with your iPhone and you were surfing Facebook or YouTube or whatever, maybe you don't ask yourself the same question. You, maybe you think actually what you're doing there is pretty interesting. So you follow whichever link, link interests you. And you're not in the situation where you ask yourself, why am I so stupid to be on Facebook right now? Uh, you're not in pain. You're not thinking of, I should just jump up and, and get out of, get out of the internet. But rather, you continue forever and ever and ever. And maybe at the end of the day, you ask yourself, why did I waste the whole day on the Internet? But until then, it's at least interesting enough to keep you on the Internet. The, the Internet is just interesting enough to keep you online. Although maybe you have a doubt in the back of our mind. Maybe I have more important things to do than that. But then still you keep on the Internet. You stay on the internet. While with the Zen, uh, I think mostly, in most cases, when you sit there and during these hours of the Zen, you might ask yourself over and over again, why am I doing that? What's the purpose of this? But then after 10 hours, usually you feel good about the fact that you stayed there sitting on the cushion. While in my case, I seldom have the same feeling of satisfaction after being on the internet for a long time. So in a way, the answer answers itself for most people. Um, the moment you are there on the cushion, maybe it doesn't feel as entertaining than other things you could do in the same time. Uh, but afterwards, after the facts, at least I never regretted 
oh shit, why didn't I spend this beautiful day with Sebastian on the beach sharing a beer? Uh, but rather I say, good, good that I was sitting here on the cushion. With Sebastian next to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even with Sebastian next to me. <laughs> uh, so what's happening there? Or um, Well, again, what's the purpose of this? Uh, what makes it non-regrettable? Mm. I think one difference between what we do in normal life and what we do when we do the Zen is in normal life there's well certain things that interest us. So, so there's there's maybe some people are interested by uh, by money and some people they might be say interested <laughs> in, in women. Um, you're interested in, in, in fame. Um, how would I write that? Uh, you're basically, basically, we're living in a world with many people, and well, there's, uh, there's this option with the beach. You could go to the beach and enjoy the beach. Mm. There's lots of things. Mm. we're in this world which is full of things and we usually we identify with one of these persons which is us and we try to get to these things that interest us and usually we try to get more than the other guys so we compare ourselves to the other guys how much do these guys get and how much do I get am I a winner or am I a loser so we live, we play this game. We're living in this game world. And uh, we never have a doubt that we basically are this one player inside this game. Mm. And... I'm not so familiar with Indian philosophy, but uh, there's this word called avatar, which you also use now on the on the online. If you're on an online forum, also you have an avatar, which is basically your online personality. And it seems that this word original means this our physical existence or our phenomenal existence in this world. So basically, in my case, it would be muho. In this world, I'm muho. And uh, there's Sebastian, there's Joanna, there's lots of other people. And I'm playing kind of this game where it's about winning or losing in this world. Um, whenever I feel I'm winning, I feel good about myself. I think everything's going fine. And when I feel I'm losing, I feel this game actually sucks. But where is this game actually taking place? Um, well, in this case, I'm writing all this stuff on the whiteboard. Um, but where does this whiteboard stand for? Basically, this whiteboard is reality that I'm experiencing right now. Um, and usually we forget this space, this white space reality that we are living and only we are only absorbed by what is happening inside this kind of the content, what, what is written on the whiteboard. And we identified with one part inside this. And what you do in the Zen is, first of all, you stop playing this game. So that's also the point in saying there's no purpose. When you <coughs> specific, uh, specify, uh, specify, 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 specify. Uh, what I try to say, specify, you, you kind of, you specify one purpose. You say Zazen is about, well, for example, for example, getting enlightenment. 
Um, then you have just another big thing here, here the big boom, the, the spiritual sun lighting up in the, in your, the big bulb here lighting up in your skull. Um, I need to get it. I need to get this big enlightenment. Or you say the Zen is about calming down your mind, the Zen is about uh, getting more relaxed, uh, maybe you have some good ideas that uh, later help you in your work life, whatever. Um, when you specify a purpose, then basically you're back in that game. You're playing the game again. And you just uh, you judge the quality of your Zen by, well, the closer you got to your purpose. So it's basically the same game that you play all the time anyway with work. Am I getting further ahead with my career? Am I getting further ahead with, with my rivals? Am I getting as much sex as I want? Am I getting as much beer on the beach as I want? And get I get close as close to enlightened as I think? Uh, do I have experiences uh, that I expected, that I read about in the books, do I get these experiences? So when we say the Zen has no purpose, then first of all, that's to get you out of this game. It means that, hey, take a break at playing this game. Um, there's no need for you to identify with this player because actually this white board where this game is happening on, or this reality, that's basically you. If you weren't there, that would mean this white board isn't here. The, the, the game can only be played because you are here. But usually we forget about this and identify only with that. And Zazen, in a way, is a, well, a means, or it gives us the opportunity to get back to this. Of course, I'm, I couldn't be living without this person, but, but actually everything that's happening in that one hour, the sounds, the wall I see, the whole physical sensations, everything that manifests is me. It's just that most of that I don't even notice because I'm so busy playing this game. Um, so if you ask me what's the purpose of the Zen, one thing that comes to mind is to get from here this little me to noticing there's this white board and the white board basically means um, that which in this moment uh, hears my voice and probably all of you hear my voice right now how can you hear that voice because you have this, because uh, you have this container or whatever, the screen on which reality appears. And once more, usually we only identify with the main actor on the screen. We think our life is only lived by this main actor on the screen. We forget about the screen. Now, that might be a little difference between Buddhism and maybe the rest of Indian philosophy. And again, I don't know much about Indian philosophy, but one impression I get from uh, Indian philosophy is that they emphasize very much that this small me is only an illusion, it's an avatar, and there's a true self. Basically, this true self is 
if this is my online identity and I play an online game with this identity, the true self would be that what remains if I switch off the computer or if there's a electric shortage, the computer gets up, uh, breaks down, there would be still my real self sitting there. And even on the internet, it happens probably to a lot of people a lot, a lot of the times that they completely forget about this self because they're so absorbed by their online identity. But at the end of the day, you have to take a pee, you have to eat, you have to sleep, and at these moments return to your true self. And it seems that in some Indian schools of thought, they think that that's literally also the case with this reality. So that there's this illusionary self of mine, and then there's a true self somewhere else. And what makes Buddhism maybe a little bit complicated is that it on the one hand says no this is not your true self on the other hand though it's not that the true self is completely somewhere else but basically this illusionary so-called illusionary small self couldn't be there without the bigger self and the bigger self can not manifest anywhere else but here so these two are not the same, but they're also not divided, um, which in, well, the Hanya Shingyo would be this famous phrase, Shiki Sokuze Ku, Ku Sokuze Shiki, which means right. Shiki Soku, uh, not that big. そこ which in Japan and English would be form is emptiness. Well, this one is pretty straightforward. Everything we see, uh, including all of us, is impermanent. But then it continues. Ku, soku, ze, shiki. These two are exchanged. Emptiness is form. And this is kind of a riddle, unless you interpret it as basically meaning the same. The same statement is made twice. Everything is emptiness. Emptiness is form. But emptiness is form seems to me mean something else. Form is emptiness. That's clear. But how can emptiness be form? Emptiness is usually interpreted as being just nothing. How can nothing be form? And you can interpret that in many ways, but one meaning of this emptiness is uh, what I just call this whiteboard or reality. That, that needs to be there for things to appear in the first place. What needs to be here for the world to manifest? What needs to be there so that sounds can be heard? Or what needs to be there so that colors can appear? Basically me. If I wouldn't be here, there wouldn't be any sounds. If I wouldn't be here, there wouldn't be any colors. And the same each of you can probably uh, say about yourself. So one 
meaning of this emptiness is yourself and yourself not in the small sense but in the sense of the whole screen form is empty needs form is emptiness means that everything you see and hear in this moment is yourself in the big sense but this big self is not somewhere else it's not in a separate place but this big self cannot manifest anywhere but here in this form. So these two are not the same, but they're also not separate. Um, so when we do the Zen, I have the feeling that depending on the person, for some people, maybe through the Zen or other forms of meditation, for the first time they realize, they notice that actually I'm not restricted to this person. Uh, I, for, the whole, for my whole life, I thought I'm, I'm just this person, this body. Uh, I have this face and that's me, uh, this name. But actually, I'm something beyond that. And for other people, it's almost the other way around. And that includes me. Like, already as a kid, I could never really think of this person as my true self. I would rather think that, like using the example of the screen, um, I always had the feeling like I'm watching a movie, which is my life. But I'm sitting somewhere back in the movie theater and there's nobody else. I'm alone in this movie theater. I'm watching this movie and there's many actors, of course. I'm the main actor in the movie. There's other actors. But why am I actually sitting here? Why don't I not just leave the movie theater? What I'm doing in this movie theater? What is it all good for? The, the movie's going to end anyway. Maybe it's a happy end. Maybe it's a bad end. But what does it interest me? I'm, I'm not really that actor. Actually, I'm sitting back here all by myself. And what I realized or what struck me with doing Zazen is that when I'm doing Zazen, it's basically it's Muho. It's this one guy. If this one guy does the Zen, for some reason, that changes everything. Which struck me because, I mean, it's the guy in the movie who's doing the Zen. How, how come that that seems to change everything? And the only explanation can be that actually I am not somebody sitting back in the cinema, but that I'm actually manifesting here on the screen. And what if there's a change on here in, in form, in, in the world of form, that is a change of emptiness. Or the change, form changing wouldn't be possible without emptiness. And emptiness is expressing also in the change of form. Um, so for some, re, for some people, the amazing thing about the Zen is that they get a little bit out from being kept in form and they realize, oh, there's also me as emptiness. And for some people, it's the other way around. They realize, oh, actually, I'm not only this transcendental emptiness, but I'm actually manifesting in form. And that uh, connects to something we also talked about in the morning, that for some people it's the hardest thing to just sit there on the cushion for an hour and then another hour and then another hour when they could be enjoying themselves or do meaningful work, for example. 
uh, some people would probably prefer to work for 10 hours doing something meaningful than just sit there in front of the wall. And then for other people, it's the other way around. For them, just sitting there and being released from the responsibility to worry about useful things and also the kind of, in today's world, which is to a great degree hedonistic, there's almost this imperative that you need to have fun. If you don't have fun, you're a loser. And some people who don't subscribe to that, just being able to sit there for 10 hours and there's no need to even have fun. You don't even have to have fun. You don't have to work. Uh, at nine you have breakfast and then at three again you have curry rice. That's a big, how do you say, release. Um, Finally, I can just sit there for 10 hours. But then it's also a challenge or, or sometimes uh, it's the true practice for these people is to get them off the cushion and tell them, yes, okay, Zazen is good for nothing. There's no purpose, but hey, there's deer in the rice fields and you're responsible for the fence. So, uh, with some people, they need to forget about the world of form, about this game from time to time and just sit down for an hour and then maybe another hour. And for some people, they need to realize there's no separate game from this. It's not that we switch off this game and then we connect to our true selves. But um, at least in Zen, as I understood, understand it, basically in the, at the end of the day, return to the game, it's just that you play it in a different way. You don't play for this one guy alone anymore, but you're concerned about the whole, everything that's happening on this board. Um, but the solution is not that we try to sit still for as many hours as we possibly can and try to survive only on rice gruel and if the deer come into the rice field let them eat the rice if the boars uh, dig up the potatoes let them dig up the potatoes i have no attachment i will just sit here and if i starve let me starve uh, that's uh, not how I see it. So sometimes the Zen means to completely forget about everything else. But then at the end of the day, it re means to return and take uh, actually everything very serious all these things that you could call illusionary existence, all these phenomena, because there's nothing but that. But that. The whiteboard is not separate from this. So the whiteboard is important because it gives space to all these other things that happen on there, like uh, the sun, the moon, the stars, and people. So it's not that you have to erase all this stuff or to forget about this stuff so that the whiteboard can appear. And the whiteboard again means yourselves. But these are never separate. The only, well, the complication only arises because we think that, well, there's only one of these aspects. Only this is the true me. And the world is something that's happening in here, in this head, when actually all of this, it's the other way around. So uh, sometimes people say reality is created by the brain, but you could just as well say the brain is created by reality. Or people say that reality is inside the brain, when in reality the brain is inside reality. Um, 
Okay, so that was a little bit philosophical. Um, うん。うん。まあ、式則性空で、あ、この式の一つの意味は現に国にいる。名前のある顔のある。私の場合はね、無法というもの。で、空はそれを超えた。今であっている全てのもの。で、まあ、あの、内山老師という人は、片方を一切
そこに変えてただその、まあ、別のゲームではないけれどもこのルールとは別のルールがあってもいいんじゃないかと要するに人との比較の中で生きなくたっていいじゃないかそもそもこのこいつとこいつとこいつは比較できててもこのホワイトボードは何の他のものとも比較できない私が言っているこの現実はムネオさんのそれとは比較することはできないだから新章は比較できてても持っているお金は比較できてても乗っている車は比較できててもおのおのが生きている世界は比較できてないなのにこのおのおのが生きている世界はほとんど問題にしてなくて世界の中の持ち物だけを問題にして比較して見ているでもそれは結局どうでもいいことになってしまうんですねだから朝からの明日からの座禅でもおそらくおのおのが全然違う十時間の座禅を過ごすことになると思うけれどもこの座禅だって人と比較できないわけですねでそういうことにはまあ座禅が一番まあ気づかせてくれていることかもしれないですね仕事だと仕事の成果があるわけですからできる人とできない人ができてしまう料理もまずい人とうまい人がいるそうすると、まあ、5日間料理当番当たった後には自分は人よりうまくできたのかな負けたのかなというのはあるけれども座禅の場合はまあ姿勢のいい悪しあしがあったとしても座禅の中身は全く比較できない全く比較できない世界でそここそいいわけですねそこがいいと思うんですね。So when you like work for a five day cycle,、um, there's a result of your work and you can compare, even though nobody really in a n t a g e would, would make any fuss about it, but you can compare, well, did I? Do as much as the others? Did I do it maybe more? Did I do less? Or if in the tens of or five days, and、um, you might compare yourself with the other tens, or、uh, how was my food com- comparison with the others, or did、uh, Dojo complain about me?、Uh, complained about me, he didn't complain about the other tens. Or, so, I'm a loser, or you think he didn't complain about me, but he complained about somebody else, so I'm a winner.、Um, with a lot of the stuff that we do, we, it's not really necessary to compare, but、uh, we can compare ourselves, and it's possible to compare. We can compare our physical、uh, statutes, we compare our faces,、uh, we can compare the results of what we do. But with the Zen, that's almost impossible. I mean, you can still compare your, your posture. My, my posture is better than your posture.、Uh, my breath is longer than your breath. But when it comes to the content or what's actually happening when you sit there, how would you ever compare that? It, it's like in this example, you can compare these three guys with each other, and you can compare. Uh, the money they own and, and the clothes they wear. But what you cannot compare is this whiteboard with another whiteboard because there's n- no whiteboard.、Um, if you wanted to compare the whiteboard, you would have to put it on a bigger whiteboard, but you can't do that. So, so basically, what I'm saying, I cannot compare my world to Sebastian's world or Johanna's world. I can compare myself with Sebastian, and I'm always kind of saying here、yeah, that's the guy who has、uh, b r o k e down our car and, and, and he, he, he made up his, his winter report and things like that. And I can say, well, I never did that. Here, look,、uh, I wrote 10 books in Japanese and they sell well. And, and here, this guy copies the stuff from the internet. But that's kind of comparison that's possible. 
But what I cannot compare is, is my world or the reality I live with Sebastian's reality. And the tragic thing, if you want to call it tragic, is that most of our lives we spend with these comparisons and forget about that only one thing that we can never compare, which is the reality right now. And uh, congratulate ourselves when we think that we won in the comparison and we pity ourselves when we think we lost in the comparison. Um, without realizing that we are living right now something that we can't even compare, which is this reality. And each of us lives a reality at this moment that you can never compare to anybody else's uh, reality. You can't even compare it to yesterday's reality or tomorrow's reality, because where are those? Where's re yesterday's reality? You only have memories of yesterday, which are part of today's reality. Um, so when you think that yesterday or 10 years ago or 50 years ago everything was better, it's basically it's just a memory of that time that you're comparing to something that you can't really uh, compare because you're trying to compare a memory to reality. How do you do that? And when you think the others have it better than me, you're also you're comparing something You're trying to compare something you can't compare because how do you actually know somebody else's reality? You only know how they look like in your reality. And in your re reality, you think you might be the loser or you might think be the winner, but actually you don't know the reality of these people. So uh, one thing that Zazen brings us to is to realize there's something beyond comparison and that's the reality I'm living right now. The reality of this one day, uh, this one person sitting here on the cushion. And you can't trade that with anybody else, even if you try to. There's no way to trade your 10 hour session tomorrow with somebody else's 10 hour session tomorrow. There's no way of trading this uh, July 10th session with June 10th or May 10th session. Um, no comparison possible. And that's something that should be obvious, but we forget quite easily. Um, so much for the time being. Do you have any questions about this or about other things? Yes, please. Um, well, when you talk about the, the movie analogy, yes. the movie theater, um, and you say that um, your distance from the movie, but yeah. then you can uh, start taking the acting in the movie mm. seriously mm. because uh, uh, the boars in the field are digging up potatoes and, yeah. and it, uh, there's some action you should take. Um, for, for me that makes sense, the action you should take for survival, but I guess what sort of action uh, or how do you decide what actions to take that are beyond sort of basic survival? Like, for example? Uh, having children or um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, having children is. Um, Mm. It's a difficult one. Um, at least for Buddhist monk, because originally the Buddha said, don't marry, don't have children. 
Uh, that's one of the main precepts and it's kept by most Asian monks. Uh, Japanese are one of the very few um, ordained Buddhists that still start families. Um, for me, the point where the very strong wish to not only have a sexual relationship, but actually also to have children, um, in my case, that came around the age of 30. Mm, sexual desire was always there, of course, but when I was young, no way I wanted children. Um, but at one point, around the age of 30, I also had a strong wish to have children. And that was at a time when I felt quite at home in the world. So, from the movie example, I... I didn't feel that distance anymore and this, this, this urge to get out of the movie cinema or asking myself, why am I sitting through this boring movie? I felt quite at home there with that movie and basically having children, this example would be to allow others to also witness a different movie maybe in a different theater, in a completely parallel universe from mine. So, so even though they are your children, I got three, but still what I said about Sebastian and me is the same about my children. I can't share their reality, they can't share mine. But by having children, you're basically allowing a different universe to appear or a different reality uh, to appear there. And when I felt happy with the fact that I'm here, I'm here, there's a universe manifesting here, there's reality manifesting here in me, I felt, oh, it would be great if I could also be the cause for new realities um, to manifest. So... When people say you must not have children, well, it could have a lot of reasons, but in a way it means we shouldn't multiply this reality. We shouldn't give cause to new realities to come into existence. Um, why? Because reality is suffering. And there I see the main difference between um, maybe the older Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. So for me, it's, it's just a logical consequence of the development of Mahayana Buddhism that today in Japan, in Japan many people uh, marry. Because if you feel okay with the fact that you're living in this reality and you're experiencing life, and of course it's not satisfactory, but it's not so bad either. It's not so bad at the end of the day. If you accept life as it is, and including the suffering, you might realize, actually, it's not so bad, and then why not have children? If you think that the, the goal of reality is to make everything disappear on this board and then eventually also the board itself develop, dissolves and that's nirvana, then of course you should not have kids. Um, so yeah, that was only about this one specific question about uh, deciding about if to have children or not. Mm. Well, you said, uh, how about other things that are not directly related to survival? Mm. I would say, I mean, you can play this, this game to the full or uh, no, you can 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 the, the problem is not so much how much of your energy you invest in it but it's the 
the problem arises out of the fact that most of the time we play it against an opponent which isn't really there like, like we, we we think that these guys are our opponents but but they're they're actually we're playing against ourselves so so we're losing a lot of the energy by playing against this imaginary opponent um, if we wanted to really play it against an opponent we would have need to have a second whiteboard there and there would have been uh, then would have to be a means to compare these whiteboards against each other, but there, there is no such point of view, except if you were God, for example. Then maybe if you were God, you could compare your reality to my reality, Sebastian's reality, but we are not God. So there's no way to play that game in that way. So when we realize actually those are not our opponents, then um, we can play the game to its full, there's no problem with that. And I, as I um, told you, I, I don't see a problem with marrying and having kids. But if you don't feel that desire, then of, of course you don't have to. But, uh, and that makes it a little bit complicated because marrying and having kids then means basically that this whiteboard produces something that doesn't exist on the whiteboard. I, I mean, there's these two... They fall in love and then they have kids, but these kids not only exist in their world, but actually it means that they are separate realities coming into existence. And I mean that's also, if you don't realize that, that often causes uh, problems in families, or in school or, or whatever, when you think that my kids is basically what I believe my kid to be. You think your kid is part of your world. And it is, of course, part of your world, but from the perspective of the kids, you're only a part of the world of the kids. And, and the, what the kid is really living is a completely different reality that you can't even share and you can't even compare it to your own. And if you deny that uh, reality of the kids, then um, you're causing a lot of trouble for both of you and you're causing a lot of pain for your kid. Any questions? Could be also technical stuff about the session or technical stuff about Sazen. If you have questions about the posture, the breath, the mind. No questions. So yeah, well, the topic of today's talk was the purpose of Zazen. Why are we doing this? And if the question arises again tomorrow in your mind when you're sitting there in front of the wall, why am I doing this? You can also use the opportunity to, yeah, dig into that. Well, why? You don't have to. You don't have to. Me, uh, no one of the, us here, nobody has to do it. 
I also mentioned that in the morning, like sometimes people tell me uh, it's not the same in the Hondo if I'm there or if I'm not there. So sometimes people say if you are there, Dojo, um, everybody sits straight and people are awake. If you're not there, it doesn't feel exactly the same. Um, which I can somehow understand. Because of course it makes a difference if, if you know all oh, the teachers there and the teachers kind of watching. Um, but on the other hand, it should be clear right from the start, you're not doing this for me. You're not doing it for me, you're not just sitting for me. And if I can help you, uh, for example, through my presence, just if the fact that I'm sitting there with you helps you, uh, well, I'm happy if I can help you in that way. But at the end of the day, you don't do this for me. So if I'm sitting there or not, uh, that shouldn't give your Zazen a purpose. It shouldn't be the purpose of Zazen to kind of impress me. Um, so in the end, only you can find the answer to the question why. Why am I sitting there? Why am I doing this? Uh, you have lots of other options. Uh, you could have spent your time, uh, and your money and your energy in different ways. But you're sitting there on the cushion. Why, why, are, you, why are you doing that? And if uh, by tomorrow you think that, oh, another day at the capsule hotel would also have been nice, <laughs> maybe even better. Um, well, maybe it means that your practice was very sincere at the capsule hotel. Uh, so there's nothing wrong about that. So, but. Uh, could also mean that you didn't give your hole on the cushion. Um, so of course it's true that practice is possible everywhere. Uh, you don't have to be in untidy to practice and you don't even have to sit on the meditation cushion to practice. It's just the, the question is do you really give yourself completely to the moments? Um, and that's probably only possible if you feel there's a purpose in that even if you couldn't explain it in words well this here is my purpose so, uh, it's probably at the end of the day it's impossible to specify it here this is the purpose of my Zazen but you, you got the feeling this is what I want to do with my time right now. Um, and if you don't have that feeling, then maybe you shouldn't be sitting, but yeah, sitting on the beach with the beer and your girlfriend. Would be nice. Yeah, well, in two days. <laughs> Only two more days and counting the time. <laughs> counting the time. When, when is the bell ringing? <laughs> okay, anything else from your side? <clears throat> Okay, if not, then thank you for your attention. And we will finish. Good Good.
Oh, 